So I wanted to, uh, to bring a project to you uh, as an example, as a case study, in putting it all together. And what I want to talk about is the impact that urban infill, the siting of the property, and the choice of property, and co-housing, which is the people side of things, and then how that uh, interlocks with, uh, with passive buildings. So for urban infill, what we're talking about is the place, the context, the location of the site, and uh, the impact that that's going to have on, the, uh, on both the uh, carbon footprint, the energy efficiency of a house, uh, the impact on climate change and uh, global warming. So uh, first we'll talk about the siting. And uh, with this, uh, this is a section of the area of downtown where we're located. The red dot is the site location. It's located on Woolwich Street, which is uh, the old Highway 6 that goes from uh, uh, Lake Erie up to north of Georgia Bay. And uh, so it's a main arterial road uh, in the city and it's the intersection of a small uh, side street there. It's about uh, 19 minutes down to the GO train. Here, we got this down here. Uh, the downtown area is two blocks away. It's uh, 50, uh, 20 minutes to the hospital. It's uh, 10 minutes to the library. It's eight minutes to the Woolwich Arms uh, pub and uh, a little bit longer sometimes coming back. <laughs> so uh, with that, we have um, a lot of parks in this area. There's the river that goes out to, to the uh, Guelph Lake. So. Uh, this is the, uh, the river that goes, it's a whole trail system along the river trails. And uh, we're just a block away from that and then a major regional park, the exhibition park here. So it has all the amenities you'd ever imagine uh, with the downtown, like I say, two blocks away from downtown, all the amenities that that provides for us. So this is the zoning map, uh, the current zoning map of the city and of this, of this portion of the city, the neighborhood. And the site, of course, is uh, circled here. So it's at the intersection of Woolwich Street and Mont Street, Woolwich Street being the commercial artery road. And the orange uh, zoning is uh, mixed office commercial zoning and the uh, yellow is uh, single family residential. Green is parks and there's lots of parks here. You see a lot of the green in this, in this slide. So this, this site is, uh, I've acquired this site uh, some years ago. Um, it's uh, two blocks away from the downtown area which is the purple on the bottom right and uh, has all the amenities that we need uh, in a walkable community. So on Woolwich Street, the nature of Woolwich Street has uh, historically uh, been residential, but it's turned over to commercial now, and uh, a good part of the, uh, of the buildings have been taken over by businesses of one sort, offices and commercial spaces. Um, we have a number of a row of about five uh, stone cottages that are from the 1860s, 1870s and they're designated. Uh, the building we were talking about that you can keep in mind here is the one on the right, which is this one, which is a Georgian uh, or an Edwardian uh, building that uh, is, frames the street, and this is the side street just to the left of it here. So that's at the intersection. This is a shot down uh, uh, the arterial road for Wood Street. This is taken on Sunday morning, no traffic. Um, it's fairly major. It has the bus routes, the uh, bike lanes and everything you'd need on there and all the businesses down each side. Woolwich Street and Mont at the corner here is the corner between these two buildings. The one on the right here is actually Zahn Engineering's head office uh, on the bottom slide here. And uh, this is the one of the designated cottages across Mont Street. And this is the designated one at the corner. So it's fairly narrow at the corner. It widens out as you get further down the uh, side street here on Mont Street. So it's a gateway from the commercial to the residential and a very important uh, place to be situated. Mont Street is situated a uh, very residential street, of course. Uh, it's all single family detached homes. Some of them are rented, mostly owned by professionals, um, all kinds of uh, lawyers, doctors, psychiatrists, some trades, uh, and uh, some younger families, but it's mostly elderly people, well established. A lot of, um, a lot of uh, landscaping on there, it's very thick. And it's uh, very diversified in terms of the architecture and the age of the homes from 1860 through to about nine, probably the 1980s and 1990s. So the existing conditions, I bought this uh, property originally here, uh, which is the corner of uh, Woolwich Street and Mont Street at, in 1981. And then I acquired uh, for my office for architectural practice and then I bought the property behind it 
on Mont Street a year later and uh, used that for parking for the most part. So I had an office of uh, about 13 people here at one point and I used the properties for parking and then the house was rented out, the house next door at 15 Mont. So you can see that there's two driveways, two double width driveways here, uh, backing out onto the street and that type of thing. The servicing is mostly on Mont Street except for the Storm Street sewer that's uh, on Woodward Street and uh, electrical service. So uh, these properties, there are a number of trees on the properties and I'll show that in the next slide here. So uh, these trees at the top here are off the property um, and they're protected trees. It's two properties, two uh, trees that are on the properties at the corners here that are also uh, designated trees and had to be retained. So what we did is we knocked down the house at 15 Mont and two garages, a garage that was over here and a garage that was over here and uh, put an addition on. So this wall is the back wall of the original house, 1897 house here. And then we put an addition on the back here. Um, so one unit is here. There's uh, service uh, space over here. And the driveway, as you'll notice here, is a one-way drive-through, single width, one-way one drive-through. And nine parking spaces in the back, including one uh, for a mobility van. So. Um, I won't go into more detail on this. Uh, we'll get into more of the detail, the plans later. The trees were protected, the driveway, the setbacks. The one thing I should notice here, if I can go back. Okay, so the, the thing I wanted to note here is this is a side yard setback. Um, the limiting distance required this particular wall to be non-combustible construction, so this portion of it. So we didn't have a lot of alternatives with that, but I'll get into the construction later, so that, just keep that in mind as a non-combustible wall. So what I wanted to say while that was playing or blaring <laughs> was uh, just the, the uh, view that that took over top of the uh, stone cottages that are designated there uh, is sure to, I'll get into the next slide here maybe for this, um, but we wanted to have a clear view there and one of the advantages that this is the ideal site as far as a passive building is concerned is that we won't have neighborhoods that are growing taller over there. So they're not even going to put a second story about these designated cottages. They're on the southeasterly side of the property. So uh, we're getting that uh, beautiful view uh, for the morning. They won't be uh, built on or added to. Um, so as far as compatibility is concerned, as far as urban design is concerned, that was a major stumbling block for us actually with what they wanted to do in providing the articulation, different uses of materials and dormers and that type of thing. And for anybody who studies the passive house, you'll understand that the simplicity of the envelope is sometimes really important. And what we had to do was mix that up, uh, putting different materials there and also different shapes and uh, forms and that type of thing to uh, address the variety of homes that are in the neighborhood. So uh, that was a challenge for us from the uh, get-go. So as far as the roof is concerned, uh, that was one of the major things. We wanted to have a roof that would be maximize the photovoltaic potential of the site, but we had to provide dormers and various other things, even the material, the roofing. They argued about not putting a steel roof on it, and we definitely wanted to have a raised seam roof. The massing and the scale of the building had to be such that it would be um, uh, in comp in, uh, compatible with the adjacent buildings. What we did was uh, we agreed to have the, um, the roof height the same as the existing building. So you can see across here, it doesn't go over that light height limit, which is a three, three and a half story building. So as far as the co-housing is concerned, what co-housing is, is basically uh, individual units that uh, people have, and uh, then they can, they can go beyond that in terms of the, um, of the uh, common space that they have. So we spend 95% of our revolutionary history in tiny groups of best a few dozen people. We're designed to work in small teams. So uh, co-housing is not new. Um, it's certainly people centers. It's a collaborative lifestyle and the residents are integral to the designs. So the nine people, the nine households that we had uh, were all part of the community as far as the design process is concerned and making selections through the construction. 
There's mutual care, shared values, uh, certainly very environmentally sensitive as far as the design is concerned. I'll go through those details later. Uh, it's health oriented, uh, accessible because this is designed to age in place. Pedestrian friendly. We have communal facilities. The communal facilities were an existing room, a 20 by 40 foot room on the third floor that we use for a number of our activities. Uh, we have a lot of activities in terms of shared resources, uh, creating artwork, uh, displaying artwork, we're sharing artwork uh, around the community and working together and uh, working with the expertise that we have in the, in the group. Uh, it's an environmentally uh, sustainable way of living as we see it. Uh, there's a lower cost of living. We share a lot of resources, meals, uh, equipment, uh, certainly expertise, uh, waste management, we've gone over the top. Um, the city wanted us to have uh, 12 bins. We're down to having five bins at the most that we ever use, and uh, we're actually lending some to the neighbors who need it more than we do, so we're far less as far as the waste is concerned. Just in terms of the impact of occupant load, uh, what this bar chart shows is the energy distribution, beginning at the top with a large detached home, going down to a smaller and smaller detached home to an attached home, which is where we're at. So with this, uh, it goes down up from 39% uh, of the occupant load is the energy distribution up to 57%. And the reason is that the space heating goes from 38% down to 12% for a detached and uh, sustainable ho house with energy efficiency. So you can see that the impact of the occupants in this uh, scenario is much more of an impact. So passive buildings, uh, the way this comes together for passive buildings, I'll just talk about the functional layout. The top uh, plan is a, uh, a diagram of the ground floor. This is uh, the office space that we're limited to. Uh, the residential is, is blue, so there's one unit on the ground floor. This is the waste recycling room, and there's a bicycle garage here. Um, in addition to that, we have an elevator that serves all the floor levels, and uh, so it's built for future, even though the code wasn't required to do that. Second floor also has uh, three units, one existing in the original building, and then there's an exterior passageway and a common deck here that we're using for all three levels. So these are different floor levels, but uh, be built uh, accessible for three, three different units here. Uh, the third floor is the top one here, and that's where we have the common space. So the common space is this large room here, and then we have two units on the top floor again with a repeated deck space there. And then in the lower level of the existing building, we have the common space. So we have an art room, music room, uh, guest room here with a kitchenette and bathroom and storage. So we have lots of that. As far as air tightness is concerned, we use the AirShield LMP uh, over the concrete block. As I mentioned to you, uh, we had to have concrete block for this back wall. We tried to use Nexum, but it's not considered to be a non-combustible material in Canada. In, it is in Australia, believe it or not but it hasn't been tested in Canada, so we can't use it as non-combustible. So we were pretty much limited to having concrete block. And at the time that we were looking at uh, costing on this project, we looked at uh, having wood for some of the building, but as it turned out, the cost of wood in the spring of 2021, for those builders who knew the costing at that time, the cost of wood was gonna be more than it would be to build this in concrete block. So we decided to continue with the same construction and have a concrete block building all the way around with precast concrete floors. So it's certainly a lot more robust than it would have been had it been uh, wood. For air tightness, our first uh, kick at the uh, blower door, we wanted to retain this uh, wall uh, in brick at the back of the original building, but we found that we were losing too much air around the perimeter of this wall. So we had to build a wall in front of that and then seal that up to, uh, to get the achieved uh, air barrier. So thermal bridging, there was a lot of uh, thought given to that, uh, especially at the junction between the balcony and the, and the units, the main building. And what we did here, we had this gap of about nine inches. There's nine inches of insulation here. And the span of the precast balconies is in this direction in the length rather than tying it into the existing wall. We also did the same sort of thing with the normal things that people would be familiar with is in terms of the continuous insulation all the way through the building. So as far as shading and orientation, we have very deep overhangs, they're about seven feet for the most part, uh, and they cover the overhead uh, walks, the passageways, and the common areas here. Uh, we have a lot of natural light coming in from the southeast and uh, lighting the units, and we also have uh, cross ventilation with the windows on the north side as well. 
Uh, certainly the decks are uh, usable space and natural light in all rooms. So uh, we get a lot of use of that space as common space. So the advanced windows, uh, I wouldn't mention the name VETA here, but it has, it is up on the board there as well. So while all the windows are, uh, and exterior doors into the units are uh, VETA doors and windows. And they're all operable for natural ventilation through the building and acoustical separation. Uh, the acoustical separation works really well. There was actually a, set of, oh, <laughs> that was a bell. Uh, so w we, uh, we actually had an alarm that was outside and all the neighbors were outside wondering where this alarm was coming from. They thought it was our building because we were uh, fairly new in construction. As it turned out, it was a neighbor. Their, uh, uh, I guess, alarm went off. Uh, none of the people inside this building heard the alarm. There, it was, the whole street was there apparently. Nobody heard, heard the building. They had, didn't know what the ruckus was all about. So anyway, we did that. So super insulation, we have nine inches of uh, rock wool uh, comfort board uh, on the exterior, comfort board 80. Um, we had to have non-combustible um, strapping even for this wall, so it wasn't what we had planned on use, using there, but we ended up with this. We had to work with them, and uh, the rest of it can be wood, uh, wood strapping, as you see on this other diagram. We also stepped the insulation, starting with uh, six inches of insulation, <laughs> at the grade level and stepping it back to three and a half as we went down the foundation wall. So balanced ventilation, uh, we started with a separate system with uh, condensers and ended up with a Minotaur units. And uh, this is a single device that provides heating, ventilation and uh, cooling. It's uh, sized to the electrical service. We were limited in the electrical service to 400 amps single phase. Um, for this very large building in comparison with all, all electric except for the original building, which is a gas boiler and heating. So we, uh, uh, Stuart uh, Z uh, from Zon Engineering, Stuart Evans, who's here, was the engineer on this and we matched the loads to the uh, heating capacity and cooling capacity. Rainwater harvesting, we added that, and uh, this is the roof plan on the top left, and uh, we have a, s a system that's pre-designed pre, uh, to filter the uh, effluent as it comes through, and we have a 4,000 gallon cistern in, in the ground beside the building with its own pressure system, and that's used for irrigation control, stormwater retention, and uh, toilet flushing eventually. So our, this is interesting as far as the uh, differences in uh, comparable loads. Uh, so these are two units here, unit number one, unit number five. Um, the loads, as you can see, for the electrical is 380 kilowatts for unit five and 709 uh, for the unit one. Cost per day, $1.27 for unit five and unit one is 247. And the difference there is there's two people in unit one, a number of other things as far as their lifestyle is concerned that would uh, make it find, find uh, a lot more uh, uh, energy consumption. Challenges in doing this, we certainly had challenges with the neighbor. We had to go to the OMB apparently. There were lots of hurdles with the city. Urban design was a, an issue for us. Um, cost savings, uh, we actually enlisted uh, the help of, of um, Adam Cohen as far as uh, getting some of the funding is concerned and getting our spreadsheets ready. So we're grateful to his input on this. Opportunities for future project, as we see it, is collaboration with uh, not-for-profits and land over developers. Uh, for co-housing particularly, it's the hardest thing is to find the land that they have. There's a number of groups that are, uh, have contacted us and they're looking for land in any community. So there's uh, a lot of uh, needs for co-housing, particularly in some of these areas, which is a, a good way to do it. So what we're looking at is uh, densification. For densification, we're looking at uh, four occupants. Uh, Previously, and now there's nine to 12 occupants, plus the office. And there's smaller units. We can go with much more compact units, in fact, than this, and even to the tiny houses and go with co-living and other arrangements as far as lifestyle is concerned. So uh, this is local owner, owned, designed, felt, built, and uh, occupied by the owner. So I'm one of the occupants there now. So that's all I have to say. Um, we are having our open house and opening on the June, June the 10th, and uh, you're welcome to come to that if you want. Just look up our website here. So thanks very much for your attention, and uh, 